over to you principal ma'am jai hind and a very good evening to viewers from dps varanasi dps nasik and dps nagpur today we have a very eminent personality with us lieutenant general said aja hasnain param vishesh seva medal uttam yuddh seva medal ati vishesh seva medal sena medal vishesh seva medal and bar is one of india's most decorated military officers he retired in 2013 as the military secretary after 40 years of service in the indian armed forces prior to that he had been specially inducted back to shrinagar to command the strategic 15 corps to restore order when the three year agitation in the streets went out of order in his long career he has served in sri lanka with the ipk f in punjab during the heyday of militancy in india's northeastern states and in seven tenures of duty in jammu and kashmir he is also commanded his unit in siachen glacier looking into today's scenario i would like to start the webinar with a tribute to the martyred brave hearts those young men jinping sent to fight all delusional in their sight they thought the year was 62 maybe they will just walk through they called santosh the guy lan seen he went and numbed he thought them clean they hit him hard and felt him down others fought they killed him down they came in with their steely knives of steel with nails and wire bath and clubs of wood that hit the head all wrapped in hands they hit us bad some that survived came back with tales that shook the core but they did not wait they promised to fight till their last breath they must avenge their ceo's death the cold dark nights they could not see they charged they yet made the chinese flee they hit them hard with all they had their will so strong to hurt them bad the enemy knew not of the will of 16 bihar their strength to kill the chinese got a bloody nose so many guns some friends some foes whose war is this we all should think who got this matter to the brink no soldier knew but they fought we haven't learned what history taught the soldiers died their kids of faint some wives lost all yet no one gained why do we fight this bloody wars that leave such brutal reeking scars on this note i welcome our eminent guest for the day lieutenant general said acha hasnain who needs no introduction otherwise i'm sure this evening is going to be with a lot of learning experience for all of us and a lot of insight into the topic today decoding the conundrum so over to general the audience is yours sir uh, good evening and jai hind thank you ma'am thank you dr prasida thank you so much what a wonderful way that you introduced the subject and you introduced me i'm extremely happy to be with you all and i'm so glad that uh, your schools seem to be having all the right things in place a webinar of this kind must start with the dedication to the brave hearts who gave up their lives so that all of us
can live securely wherever we are in the rest of India. I'm so glad that you started with that because that just shows that there is a recognition, necessary recognition. And in the early stages of your life, in your education, you need to realize that there are people out there who are giving up their everything for you. You may not join the army tomorrow. Many of you may not join the armed forces tomorrow. But you should be aware of what the armed forces do for you. You should, your awareness, your overall going into the world, knowing exactly what happens on the borders of your nation makes you that much stronger in your will and your resolve to do well in life. So thank you very much. Let me start on that on that score. I hope I am audible to you clearly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I do have a I do have a PowerPoint presentation which I made at the last minute because I did realize that this subject is very complex. And uh, to speak on it and make you try and understand this um, will actually achieve no purpose if you don't get the, the maps into your mind and the inquisitiveness which you must have to go on to Google Images perhaps and search for maps and look for those very sites which I will be talking about. So I don't have too much time on my hands. I think this whole webinar is about one hour. And we've already gone through seven minutes. I presume that we can continue till about 7.10, which will mean that I should talk about 40 minutes or so and uh, leave at least 20 minutes, 25 minutes for your collective questions to come together for clarifications or suggestions or anything you wish to have. Okay, so I'll start with maps. For about seven, eight minutes, I will start with a few maps to keep the interest levels high. And then I will go into one slide which I've made uh, which summarizes the historical aspects of India's relations with China. And then I will speak about China's strategy against India today, why things have changed. Obviously, even as we are speaking, there are things happening in Ladakh. The Chinese army, or what is called the People's Liberation Army, has uh, mobilized not too many forces. They have mobilized maybe a division worth about maybe 10 to 15,000 troops. Uh, the Indian Army has mobilized uh, a very fairly large segment of the army into Ladakh, into Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, into Sikkim and into Arunachal Pradesh. These are the areas where the problem generally exists. And the uh, People's Liberation Army is similarly also, uh, has also mobilized in front of those locations. But the, my prime focus is on Ladakh and I'll tell you the reasons for uh, even as you're speaking, two days ago, on the, three days ago, on the 22nd, our core commander, General Harinder Singh, met his counterpart from the other side in an 11 and a half hour meeting they had. What were they discussing for 11 and a half hours? Obviously, they were looking at maps and they were convincing each other that you are right and I am wrong and I am right and you are wrong. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, they came away with some agreement. But the very next day, you find tension has come, on, come back again. This is similarly, they happened on the 6th of June when they met. Uh, within 10 days, you had the standoff at uh, the Galwan Valley where you lost uh, 20 of our brave hearts. And many Chinese soldiers were killed. So each time that the, that the core commanders, the senior officers seem to meet, uh, they do have agreements, but nothing seems to get implemented. So the backdrop to that essentially is the cultural aspect. Remember, China is a communist country. China is not a democracy like India. Right, China is a, under the Communist Party of China. Uh, it's got uh, Xi Jinping like a president for life now today, and uh, and uh, he is uh, attempting to do a lot to increase the overall power of China. And we'll talk about that a little more. But China is not a country which really believes in implementation of rules. In your school, you have rules. If you don't follow your rules, your principal is going to get after you. The teachers are going to get after you. They're going to get punished. Well, here, you establish the rules, but China doesn't seem to want to obey them. They feel that they, they are the ones who will set the rules. Sorry. We are a nation of 1.3 billion people also. We are a country of a $2 trillion economy. We are a democracy. We have respect in the world. We follow a rule-based order, and we do not believe in the Chinese communist system. Right? 
So this is the mismatch which keeps happening. And the last two days, again, a lot of tension has come up uh, in Ladakh. So let me now straight away go to the PowerPoint uh, presentation and share that. Just a second. Uh, yeah, I have to go up on top and, and uh, share screen here. Yeah, yeah. Share screen. Yeah. Just a second. I hope uh, you can see the uh, slide, and I will I will make it available to you in a better way here. Right now, on this map, uh, mostly an army person on this map will be able to talk for about six to eight hours. Each of these maps, six to eight, ten hours, you can speak. But these maps are our bread and butter. Now, what I want to tell you is, if you can see my cursor, and I'll keep using my cursor. Uh, this is India right at the center here. This is China here. This is the Indian Ocean here. Um, and uh, can someone just unmute and tell me that uh, the cursor can be seen and the map is uh, properly seen? Can someone just unmute and tell me? It's seen, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. So this is India. This is Now, this is... This is Jammu and Kashmir. This is Jammu and Kashmir, what you're seeing with my cursor. I only want, and this is Pakistan. This is Pakistan. This is China. This is the South China Sea here. South China Sea. This is the eastern seaboard of China. Couple of few things only I want to tell you from this map, otherwise, you can carry on forever. Uh, the Chinese have got a major problem with the rest of the world. The problem is that. All their development has taken place in this area where you see the cursor. This is the eastern China. This is where Shanghai and places like that, Shenzhen, all the manufacturing takes place here. To do this manufacturing, they require energy. They require oil, natural gas. Some of this oil and natural gas comes from Russia. But most of it comes from here, from the Arabian, from the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, from these countries to the Gulf region. And it all comes by this route. It comes from here. It goes through the Straits of Malacca. And that's why this man, this uh, heading is called the Malacca Syndrome. It comes through the Straits of Malacca and comes like here to Hong Kong, this area of Shenzhen here, to the north. And this is, the, this is where the manufacturing is all taking place over the years. And after the goods are finished and China is today the hub of the supply chain of the world, it provides uh, spare parts, spare mobiles, and all kinds of uh, cheap technological things and things like that. So toys, particularly, for example. Uh, so after everything is manufactured, this whole thing is taken from here by ship, by containers, and brought back to the South China Sea through the Straits of Malacca, below Sri Lanka here. And it goes to the Suez Canal, or it goes to Africa, or it comes to India, or it goes to Pakistan. Or it, some of the stuff goes into Southeast Asia and to Australia. So you can see that both things which I spoke to, the, one of the very important portions was the Straits of Malacca. What the Chinese are extremely afraid of. Two things. Number one, they think that India is a competitor with China. That India does not, cannot uh, tolerate China being a number one country of Asia or looking to be the number one country of the world. So India is a competitor, and that India needs to be needs to be pressed down. It needs to be impinged upon. Uh, it needs to its confidence to be low comparatively. So they will, at from time to time, they will want uh, to do certain actions by which India is made to look low, right? Now, India. What they are really afraid of, of India about? is the fact that India controls the complete Indian Ocean here, the Straits of Malacca, and you've got the Andaman and Nicobar Islands here. And uh, so the Chinese are extremely afraid that if the Indian Navy is strong enough, or if it, if it clubs up with the US Navy, the Japanese Navy, Vietnam, Australia, UK, then this entire area will get closed off. And at will, whenever they wish to, they can stop the Chinese shipping from here the three lines of communication, which means China's 10% growth at one time, 14% growth at one time, are all come down falling. And that China's comprehensive national power, its economy not being strong, China will not be able to look towards being the number one nation of the world in the future. Right? Now, if it is afraid of India doing that, 
it must ensure that India has a weak navy and not a strong navy. India must not club, it must not have partnerships with uh, the US, with UK, with Japan. It's, China is not comfortable about India having all these partnerships, right? The other important thing is that the Ch Chinese think that if ever this thing happens, that these areas of the Indian Ocean get blocked off, then they must have an alternative route. Oil and gas to, into China and also take the finished goods out of China. The best route they find is through Pakistan. So they've, they've come out with this whole initiative called the Belt and Road Initiative to connect up the world by, by road, by by shipping uh, so that energy can come into China and goods can flow out of China. Out of that, one of the most important roads is the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is inside Pakistan. It runs through an area called the gilgit baltistan area, which you have heard of, and I will show you on the map subsequently. So this area becomes very important. Jammu and Kashmir, in the north is gilgit baltistan which is also part of Jammu and Kashmir, but at the moment under occupation of Pakistan. So this is the route from um, from uh, Xinjiang via Gilgit Baltistan over through this route from here to a port called Gwadar and that's the port they have helped the Pakistanis to construct right now they want India to always keep looking here in the north they want to keep our gaze here our focus here so that we don't look here our attention must not be here where China's main weakness lies any nation which is making good strategy and good plans will always want to work to counter their own weakness and enhance their own strength. Their strength lies here. Their weakness lies here. So they're ensuring that they enhance their strength here by working on certain um, issues which are historical, coming down from the British times. Now, see, these are the territorial disputes which are existing from the British times. Now, if you divide out Jammu and Kashmir into the parts which is, under which it is existing today, although Jammu and Kashmir is one and we claim the whole of Jammu and Kashmir, it is it's part of India, but yet to explain, you have to divide this out into parts. See, it start, let's start from the right side. Let's start from the east. This is the McMahon line, and the McMahon line was established sometime in 1914, 1916. Around that time, it was between Tibet and the British Empire. And uh, that it, this was a line on a map which was drawn out. And, but, the, but the Chinese say that the Tibetans were never authorized to sign an agreement. The Tibet, Tibetan was never a country on its own. It was always supposed to be a part of China. So they don't recognize this Macmahon line. And they claim the whole of Arunachal Pradesh, which they call Southern Tibet. Right? The second area which they claim is in uh, the area of Sikkim. But in this, in this problem has been resolved. By and large, the map problem or the claims that China had has been resolved and China doesn't claim Sikkim anymore. But despite that, in 2017, we had a major problem in Doklam, if you remember. Doklam is right here, between Bhutan and Sikkim here. This valley which you're seeing, this little area. This, this came up. And this year, in the month of May, on the 9th of May, uh, they had a clash with an Indian patrol at a place called Nakula, which is in northern Sikkim. So they're trying to reactivate this whole problem, which has already been resolved completely. Then if you remember, there was a bit of a problem which happened with Nepal of all of a sudden uh, this year, uh, a problem of Lipu Lekha, a problem of Lipu Lekha and the problem of Kalapani. Kalapani has been for long claimed by Nepal, but nothing much has happened on it. Uh, Kalapani is, a, is, a, is, a, is an area of a spring where lots of water from the mountains comes and collects together. They claim that this entire water is there and India should have its map south of that. There is a bit of a little bit of a dispute. I mean, it can be it can be resolved. No one has really put attention to resolving it. But all of a sudden, why has this come up in 2020? Obviously, the Chinese have instigated the uh, Nepalese, and Nepal has a communist government, a Maoist government, and uh, uh, China is trying to ensure that uh, this Nepalese government looks more towards China and doesn't look towards India. Well, Nepal has traditionally been a very good friend of India. We have got 40, 50,000 soldiers from Nepal who serve with us. We have got uh, thousands of pensioners from, the, from Nepal who have served with the Indian Army. Many, many people from Nepal have given up their lives for India. So our relationship is a special relationship. 
Okay. And then you have a bit of a problem in this area of Himachal Pradesh, in this area of Korek uh, in Himachal Pradesh. And then you have this major problem in the area of Aksai Chin here. Yeah. And then this is the area which has been given by Pakistan to China, which is 5,000 square kilometers of territory. So you're seeing that one, two, three, four, or five, six areas where China can keep doing something or the other to keep our gaze and attention on the northern borders. All of a sudden, why has this suddenly happened in 2020? I will explain that separately. Right? So this is the broad, these are the broad areas where this problem has actually happened. Now, if you remember on the 5th of August last year, India abrogated Article 370 and we created two union territories. One was the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. You can see here the Jammu region and the Kashmir region and one large union territory of Ladakh complete. Now, this includes the area of Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which is here, not marked, and the whole of Gilgit Baltistan, which is here. Is shown as part of Ladakh. So today, legally, the Indian position is, as per the 1994 resolution of the 22nd February resolution, which was the joint resolution of both houses of parliament, the entire territory of Jammu and Kashmir, which consists of JNK here and Ladakh, including Gilgit Baltistan and Pakistan occupied Kashmir, all belongs to India. 5th of August, Article 370 was abrogated. These two things were done. This resolution goes back to 1994. So this is how our official map looks today. But then now you need to have an explanation of how the reality on the ground is. The reality on the ground is that this is this pink portion you're seeing here is Pakistan occupied Kashmir is a narrow area. This huge area is Gilgit Baltistan, through which the Indus River flows like this, right? And this area is what is Ladakh at the moment with us. And this Aksai Chin area is the area which was occupied by China in 1962. Uh, for a, uh, it fought the war and occupied this area and then it led to the creation of the line of actual control, which is what is the dashed line here. You can see a couple of dashes here. Right. The reason why after, after fighting the war in 1962, the Chinese withdrew, uh, withdrew in Arunachal Pradesh, Area they kept it under their control. There's one reason why the Western Highway. Incidentally, this area is all flat open area. Flat open this is a plateau, right on the other side of the line of actual control. Uh, it's a desert area, high altitude desert area, heights of about 15, 16, 17,000 feet on this area. They constructed this road to connect up the rest of Tibet from Lhasa, the rest of Tibet, from Chengdu, the road coming from there, all the way going up to the area of Xinjiang. This area here is Xinjiang, uh, which is the northwest uh, portion of, of China. So this road, is a, this road, which is not marked here, I think there's a map on it which has marked, but this is a very, very important road, right? Now, what is the line of actual control? This is the line of actual control. They withdrew behind this, but in 1993, we had an agreement with China that uh, we will resolve our borders and we will establish peace and tranquility on the, on the borders. One of the first points in, in, in realizing this peace treaty was the marking of the line of actual control on the maps, the Ellis. But the Chinese, since 1993, we've had 22 meetings of the border, the, the border group, as it's called. And, and the Chinese have refused to ever negotiate the line of actual mark. Because if you want to, if you want to resolve the border, give some, take some, whatever it is, you need a temporary line to work on. And that is what India was proposing, that the line of actual control, we should resolve it and we should have one line of actual control. Today, the problem is the Chinese perceive a line of actual control coming like this. And we perceive it to be here. So there are overlapping areas in many places where they claim some land. 
when our petrols go and their petrols come, inevitably there's a clash. And this is the prime problem which takes place, not only here, but also in Arunachal Pradesh, also in Himachal Pradesh, in Uttarakhand, in Sikkim. Sikkim is much less, but these are all these areas, right? Now, uh, the other interesting thing to see here is, there's a connect here, there's a, the Siachen Glacier is also here. The Siachen Glacier, and this is the triangle of the Siachen Glacier, which is in, remains in dispute, so-called, by the Pakistanis. But we have occupied the whole sea change. And uh, this is the source of a tremendous amount of fresh water to flow into the Indus through a valley called the Nubra Valley. And it flows into the, into the Indus here, ultimately. So if the sea change glacier is in our hands, fresh water resources of Pakistan remain in our hands. And that's why the Pakistanis are very interested in getting us out from here. Besides that, the Pakistanis want to connect up their border in such a way that it can go directly to the Karakoram Pass here. So the, all this territory becomes theirs. As it is, they have given this to Pakistan, to China, and all this territory also becomes theirs. Now, Siachen Glacier, you can see, is very close to Eastern Ladakh, which is here in our control. And so there's, there is a very strategic connectivity between these two, where the area of Dolat Beg, Old DBO, which you're reading in the newspapers, there's a very intense connectivity. Now, this is only for your interest. This is where the Fingers Complex is. You are reading a lot on the Fingers Complex. Uh, this is the Pengongso Lake. The Pengongso Lake is also here near the line of actual control. One third of it lies in, 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 on our side. Two thirds lies on the other side. I mean, of course, this whole area is, belongs to India, but it is under occupation of China at the moment. So at the moment, when I say one third of it lies on our side, it means the line, area which is in our control. And two thirds lies in the area of China. Okay. This is the fingers complex of the Pengongso, and this is this is the line of actual control here. You can see it's lying here. LAC. As I know, LAC is a single line, but it is uh, the, the Chinese perception is different, and our perception is a little different. So these are the fingers which are flowing out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm not going to go into the tactical and the strategic reasons for why the Chinese are wanting to uh, evict us or take us, not allow us to come into the areas we claim. Actually saying, we claim areas right up to finger eight, right? The Chinese actually say that our area is only up to finger two, right? So somehow they seem to accept that we can come up to finger three maybe below, a little below that, a little ahead of that. They want to remain at finger four. They want to occupy the line of actual control at finger four. And over the years, this has been leading to a problem because we have been sending our patrols, we have been sending our patrols to, to finger eight, which is almost eight kilometers away. Uh, they have been sending their patrols to finger four. And uh, from time to time, there have been clashes uh, between these patrols over a period of time. Uh, let me kill this issue here. What is the meaning of clashes when it comes to the context of India and China on the line of actual control in the past? Primarily, these clashes are unarmed. Uh, no one has fired a bullet from 1975. No one has fired a bullet. No one has died. There has not been a there has not been a single bloodshed till the 15th, 16th of June 2020 when it happened in Kalwar. And uh, the way that uh, whenever we, the patrols came face to face with each other in what is called a face off, then they stopped and, the, and they showed banners to each other to say, you have come into my territory, please uh, retreat and the other side would similarly show. They would both camp there for a short while and they would go away. And then uh, the uh, both sides would try and leave some telltale signs by leaving a few biscuit wrappers, chocolate wrappers, skins of milk, etc. to say, or made in India items and the Chinese made in China items, leave them in those areas and to show that this area is ours. So there's a very benign way, a very gentlemanly way of, uh, of, of conducting themselves until this issue happened. After Doklam, suddenly things started changing. And we had, a, we had the, for the first time after Doklam in this area, broad, broad area here on the, on the beaches here, we had a problem between the Chinese and the Indian patrols where thrown, stones were thrown at each other. And this year, on the 5th of June, that's where we had a very major um, 
battle of fists between fists and sticks and things like that. A lot of Indian soldiers were injured. The Chinese were also injured. And that finally led to what happened on the 15th, 16th of June. Okay. Now, this is the site of the clash uh, on the 16th of, 15th, 16th of June. This is, this is the Shok River, very, very important river, Shok River, Shok River Valley. It ultimately goes into, into Pakistan or Pai Kashmir or rather into Gilgit, Pakistan. And this is the Galwan River, which comes and joins up here. This is the area of the estuary. This is the area of the estuary where today a lot of, uh, a lot of satellite photographs are showing that there is some encampment here. No one is certain it is the Indian encampment or the Pakistani or, or the, the Chinese uh, encampment. It's not very certain. But this is the broad direction of the line of actual control. And this is from, all from public, from the public domain. So one can't be certain about it, but this is the broad uh, line of actual control. And this is, this, this is where the Chinese bulldozers were working on some kind of a project to divert the water from here. Uh, this is the place where the actual clash has taken place. And this side, there's a very strategic road which we have constructed. This road is called the Darbuk DBO Road, or it's called the Darbuk Shiok and DBO Road. DBO is Dalat Beg Oldi, which is a location north up to here, so north from here. Dalat Beg Oldi. Now it's very it's a crucial location. Dalat Beg Oldi on the Karakoram range. This is all the Karakoram. And that on the Karakoram range and the Siachen Glacier um, and, uh, on the Saltoro or the uh, other side of the Saltoro range between the Karakoram and Saltoro. The Siachen Glacier and the DBO complex are the two major complexes which give us our ability to defend the Karakoram tract, this whole tract of this area. If these areas are stay around here, it will have to pull back substantially from this area. So I'll kill this point here. Now, a few issues of the historical context. You see, in 1949 to 1978, I'll cover it here very briefly. Uh, you had the Chinese Communist Revolution first. Then, uh, this you remember, 1949, China became completely communist, of course. And the annexation of Tibet took place in 1959, and the Dalai Lama had to flee from China, come to India. So the whole of Tibet became Chinese territory. We have virtually recognized it. A lot of demand today that we should we should de-recognize it virtually and uh, we'll tell the rest of the world also to de-recognize unless China uh, exhibits a better strategic behavior for the, in the rest of the world. Then in 1962, we had a border war uh, with China. Uh, the Chinese were somehow interested in evicting us from their areas of the claim lines. They, they fought a war, they defeated the India. India was unprepared for the war completely. The army did not have the weaponry at all. We didn't have manpower uh, available. But surprisingly, they didn't, um, they didn't uh, press into these claim lines. Except for Excite Chin, they withdrew almost everywhere. It seemed as if they just wanted to send a strategic message to India that China is the number one emerging power of Asia and that India cannot compete with China. After that, it started supporting Pakistan in a very big way. It supported Pakistan's nuclear program also. Um, and it, why? It's because it primarily, if you look at the map, you'll realize that uh, uh, China on one side and Pakistan on the other side of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, this is the ideal area where collusion, cooperation, strategic cooperation between the two can take place. If China wants to fight a war with India, Pakistan is a very crucial ally because Pakistan will also do some pinpricks on our border to make sure that we cannot remove the army from up from the Pakistan border. Similarly, if you fight a war with Pakistan, the Chinese can also play ball for Pakistan. Although they didn't do it in 1971, they didn't do it in 1999, they really didn't do it in 1965 either, right? But the threat is always there. It's called the two-front war. And you must have heard about it many times. The army chief or the CDS and the Raksha Mantri keep talking about this. It's called a, a two-front war, which means a simultaneous war being fought by India against China. Uh, against uh, Pakistan, and sometimes as a matter of interest, is sometimes it's also called two and a half front war. What is two and a half front war? Point five, the half front is the internal security issues in India. That is the Nakshalite corridor, the internal security problem in Jammu and Kashmir, the, the, some of the issues in the Northeast with some of the separatist groups. All this can combine together to form one more half front for which you require to have some of the armed forces uh, looking after. 
Okay, and then uh, of course the Karakoram Highway came up. Uh, the construction of the Karakoram Highway started uh, after 1963-64 when the Shaksgam Valley was handed over by Pakistan to China, and it was completed sometime only in 1979. And it became the alignment along which uh, uh, near about near about which the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has been constructed. Right now, if you remember 1966 onwards on even before that, the China was under what is called the Cultural Revolution. And uh, Mao had uh, emaciated China, it became very weak. There was hardly an economy left. There was a famine, there was nothing to eat. Uh, but it was, a, it was a, a communist state. When Mao died, in the 70s, you came up with a new leader called Deng Xiaoping. And he started in 1978 what is called the Four Modernizations. This is the beginning of the modernization of China. The four modernizations were primarily, number one, the modernization of agriculture, so that you become, China becomes self-sufficient in food. Number two was the modernization of uh, technology, or rather industry. The third was modernization of technical education. Uh, if you remember, it was Rajiv Gandhi in 1986 who, who came out with this whole thing of technolizing India, giving it a technological uh, you know, advancement. Uh, China did it eight years before that in 1978. And the fourth modernization of, the, of China was the armed forces. And that was the fourth priority, the last priority. And they said that till the first three are not achieved, the armed forces modernizations will not start. And this was the, this was amazing strategy with Deng Xiaoping played through. In the middle, there were some major issues which happened in between India and China, 86, 87. Before that, in 1967, we had a standoff at uh, the Nathula, in which uh, the Indian army held on. We killed about 350 Chinese soldiers, and we lost about 85 of our soldiers in a standoff, which took, took uh, the better part of almost a month. But uh, we had a very, very strong general officer there, General Sagat Singh, who held on to it at that time. It demonstrated to China that India had changed from 1962. And then, we had in 86, 87, a thing called the Sundarong Chu incident, where the Chinese came down into a particular area and India went and stood in front of them, stared at them, put our armed forces there, and for six months to a year, both armies looked at each other and finally the Chinese went back. Right? This was the time of General Sundar Chi. And in 1989, they had the Tiananmen Square incident. If you go to China in Beijing today, the Tiananmen Square is a very important landmark which all tourists visit. This is where a couple of hundred students, young leaders were killed by Chinese tanks, when a whole democratic movement was uh, afoot in China. And that became very clear that China would become modern, but it would never leave communism, or at, at least it would make every effort not to leave communism, and would not allow democratization of China, as exactly what they're doing today in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, an uh, agreement of 1997 has given 50 years to Hong Kong to remain a democratic element entity within the state of China, within the Chinese country. But, and what is with what is called uh, um, one nation, two systems. Hong Kong to remain democratic without all kinds of new laws which are, which are, being, which are being expressed there. Okay. Then uh, in 1990 onwards, they had a phenomenal GDP growth growing up to 14% growth. And uh, this is the time around 97 when George Fernandez for the first time gave this warning to India. That India's real enemy was not uh, uh, Pakistan, the real enemy was China. And that China was making phenomenal um, progress in, in, in the economy, and one day it would become so powerful that it would start looking at India with a different eye. How true it was. 1993, there were border, border protocols signed between China and India, and I told you since then, from, we've had 22 meetings, but we've not been able to resolve the problem, even the line of actual. A new military doctrine was also adopted by China, very interestingly. They adopted a doctrine called the War Under Informationized Conditions. They learned a lot of lessons from the Gulf War I uh, in 1990. And they said that is a war in which CNN and BBC entered into the drawing rooms of the world. Because suddenly there was a television revolution and information became a very important aspect. So China used, started using information as a weapon system particularly to, on the aspect of psychological warfare, information warfare, and things like that. By 2003, 2003, 2005, 
they came out with what is called, sorry, they called the adoption of a new military strategy. Uh, a ramping up of military capability at the borders and started NAC transcriptions. The new strategy was called, actually the new strategy was, it was called three warfares. What are these three warfares? Number one, legal warfare, which is what they're trying to do on Galwan Valley again, right? Although Galwan is considered to be a reasonably settled area, but they are trying legal warfare there. Number two, they tried, they, they came out with the, the second type of warfare was media warfare. And the third was cyber warfare along with psychological warfare. So this became the main, this has become the mainstay of China's strategy. And if you're, if you are being noticing, if you are on social media, lots and lots of um, videos are floating around today. Chinese are showing themselves in the manner of how every Chinese soldier is, as if he's 10 feet tall, 20 feet tall. Look at the capability of the manner he handles his weapon. See the technology that China has got. All that is being shown to India today, right? Uh, this is all part of information warfare. Don't worry about it. It will. Uh, don't let it affect you. Enough with us, we are technologically reasonably well advanced. Maybe not as advanced as China. Um, our economy may not be as big as China today, but we are not 1962. Just remember that we are not here in 1962. We are a confident nation which has grown and grown naturally and grown democratically. That's the most important thing. So from uh, about 2005 onwards, this LAC transgression started in Ladakh. And this is the time that I, in my in my analysis i feel that this it dawned on the chinese leadership that uh, they needed to keep india india's attention pegged to the northern himalayas to the himalayan belt and india must not pay attention to its navy must not pay to attention to its the maritime front at all from 2013 onwards they started ramping up their aggression and became much more aggressive and offensive and military standoffs started it led to 2017 when we had the uh, issue in Dokla, jostling and things like that. And somehow the Chinese, by pulling back in from Dokla in 2017, seem to have got a perception that the world is thinking that India got the better of them in Dokla. Actually, the truth is that in Dokla, they had to pull out after 72 days because uh, there was a BRIC summit coming up in which Mr. Modi was also going to attend. And then there was the 19th Congress of the Communist Party of China, which takes place every five years. Uh, that was also coming up at that, at that particular time. So the Chinese withdrew, I mean, whatever had happened. Uh, but Mr. Modi went to Wuhan and we established what is called the Wuhan spirit and the informal summits uh, concept started. And then Mr. Xi Jinping came to India. He came to, uh, to Mahabalipuram in Chennai. And uh, there they had a meeting again. And we were hoping, we were thinking that... Uh, this is a good policy uh, where we have economic cooperation with, uh, with China. After all, economic cooperation with China is a good thing for India, although the trade uh, balance is in favor of China to a substantial degree. But uh, yet we could get some of the technology from them. Some of major parts could come in and some of our manufacturing could depend on, on the parts which were being manufactured reasonably cheaply uh, in, 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 in China. But uh, we also felt that uh, these border standoffs, these border issues could be put in the back burner and we could first build up our relationship, our economic and our social relationship together so that at a certain later stage, it becomes much easier. Once we are more friendly, when we are more dependent on each other economically, it will become easier to resolve the, the border issues. But the Chinese obviously have got different ideas. So what is the Chinese? What China has is definitely feeling is that India has does not its potential of India is still unrealized that India can be a very very powerful nation Mr. Modi had announced a five trillion dollar economy the aim of making this economy by 2024 of course COVID-19 has come and probably put some impediment uh, in that hopefully we'll be able to overcome this in the near future a five trillion dollar economy will make you the third largest economy of the world US China India um, and it also feels that this underlies potential is a major threat to China's ambitions. So it only thinks long term. I'm sorry for the spelling. This should be long term. It only thinks long term. Now, what is the strategy that they are following? 
currently they are smarting under uh, you know the world is looking at them and saying oh you are responsible for the covid 19 virus so the wuhan virus mr trump also said wuhan virus there's an image deficit which they are suffering from that as if they face defeat in dockland right uh, then they are they are trying to set a new narrative for this covid 19 post covid 19 world where they feel that a new world order will emerge the united states will become a much weaker nation japan uh, will be a competitor india may become a major competitor uh, europe will be weakened to a great degree so they want to start setting the narrative from now on so coercion against various countries now if you notice uh, against taiwan against uh, vietnam they have sunk a boat fishing boat of theirs they've gone and occupied certain areas of the exclusive economic zone of malaysia they have tried to act awkward with many other south asian southeast asian countries but they have seemed to have reserved their main focus for india and they seem to be wanting to overcome that particular image deficit which emerged from 2017 and a very interesting terminology is being used by many many people around the world is called wolf warrior diplomacy what is wolf of warrior diplomacy? And today, if you pick up the Asian Age today, the newspaper, and you open the center spread, you'll find an article by me on wolf of warrior diplomacy. You get a chance to read it. It is wolf warrior diplomacy is basically China uh, attempting to, to put down those nations who it, it thinks have the capability to compete against China and prevent China from emerging as the number one. Japan is one of them, right? South Korea is among among them. Uh, of course, the U.S. is one of the major countries, and India is among them. So they want to use all kinds of means of to subjugate military coercion, psychological coercion, economic coercion, political coercion, speaking in different languages, not agreeing to agreements which have been signed before. All kinds of things to keep the whole issue obfuscated. And they want to keep us focused to the Himalayan front, while the main threat is in the maritime zone, as I told you. They are worried by improved Indian capability in Ladakh, particularly this DBO road, and which is why they are wanting to, you know, impinge on in the Galwan Valley area, from where which there is a visible dominance over the road. There is an enhanced collusion with Pakistan, and they feel that India, by declaring uh, article 3, by removing Article 370 and declaring the whole of Jammu and Kashmir as part of India, including Aksai Chin, and also laying further claims to say that they will get back Gilgit Pakistan and get back POK. They seem to be thinking they are perceiving that China, India is getting strategically too confident and will pose a threat to China in the in the in the coming years. So they again with Pakistan, they are looking at collusion with Pakistan. So far, nothing. Pakistan has done nothing in this whole crisis in Ladakh. But we are we are at the very early stages of this crisis because I think this is a long-term crisis and this could continue for quite some time. And lastly, it won't resolve the LAC, nor will it delineate it. Because by resolving the LAC, then the border problem is virtually look. You have to start looking at the resolving the overall border problem. But if the LAC remains fuzzy, right, the undemarcated. Then the same issue of petrol clashes and this that will continue, and that's what China wants to do. So uh, I will uh, stop this here, but I will continue on some other aspects. Uh, let me just put this part here. I'll just remove this. Yeah. I will stop share and continue to speak. Right. Now uh, let me come back to a few other issues before I stop in the two, three minutes. In this entire affair, is India alone? India has got a lot of friends. We are got a very good standing in the world uh, overall. Um, one of the major reasons why the Chinese are doing this is they fear that India has, get, has got too close to the United States. And that uh, they want to warn us that if you become a part of partnerships, then you will have to suffer. Right? Of course, there are other theories to say that that is also not true by pushing us into but by pushing us or coercing us, actually, they're pushing us closer to the United States uh, in one way. When many of the commentaries in the newspapers you see is that uh, India is actually getting closer to the United States. Very interestingly, uh, we are still using diplomacy. War doesn't seem to be an option. It's not necessary. In India, a lot of people feel that if there's been a fight on the line of actual control or if there's been a fight and shelling on the LOC 
against Pakistan, the next day war is going to start. It's not so. These things don't happen so quickly. We are nowhere near a war at the moment. But yes, things can go back. Things can go back. Uh, we have mobilized. We have put up our troops. And we have a lot of problems of mobilization because the terrain friction in our area and our side is difficult. The Chinese have much easier ways of, of being able to approach their, their areas of deployment. Our air force is strong. Our air force is deployed. Our airfields are down below. And this is a very interesting aspect. If your airfields are low ground, Pradhanport, Hanwara, places like that, then obviously uh, you don't have problems of density of air. So you can pick, you can lift all your armaments and you, and you can go into that desert, in, in high altitude desert area and fire them. The Chinese airfields are all in the high altitude desert. And there's a problem of density of air and takeoff. So they can't use all their armaments. They can't take off with all their armaments. So that's a major disadvantage uh, to them. Um, an inevitable question people will ask, who will win a war between India and, Pakistan, India and, uh, and uh, China? As a good Indian military man, I will always tell you that India will win it. But the ground reality is that uh, these kind of wars are not winnable wars. These are, these are border clashes, essentially border conflicts which will take place. Uh, they will take place for 10 days, 12 days, 15 days. And the international community will be most concerned and they will make sure they will attempt to try and stop all this. Why? Particularly because this region has got nuclear weapons. China has got nuclear weapons. India has got nuclear weapons. Pakistan has got nuclear weapons. <coughs> so that's a very important aspect. I think I've taken a lot of time. So I have to now close and I hope I've been able to convey the broad sense of it. What you need to just remember is India is capable today to hold its own. Also remember, don't expect anyone else to come and fight your battles. If you think that the Americans are going to come and fight for you or the Japanese are going to come to come and fight for you, sorry. The Indian Army and the Indian Armed Forces are capable. The Indian people are capable. We will fight our own wars if it comes to a war. And I don't think this is coming to a war, although there will be a fairly long standoff, this so-called situation which is coming and going on at the moment. The Chinese will not pull back in a hurry. They will agree one day, disagree the other day. And that is how their strategy will come. Thank you very much. I will stop there and, and I'll wait for questions. Uh, sir, I have my co-panelists, yeah. uh, students from the three schools, Varanasi, uh, Nasik and Nagpur. Now they have some questions for you. And I'm sure uh, over to Arushi. Jai Hind, sir. Uh, so I just wanted to ask that if China tries to breach the treaty that was signed for the borders once again, then what will be the actions taken against China by the UN and by India? Interesting question, Arushi. Uh, but if you remember, I alluded to this issue in the middle of my talk when I said China is not a country which believes in a rule-based order. You remember the, that uh, the issue of the nine-dot line in the South China Sea, where China has gone and constructed artificial islands so that the artificial islands give it the right to have an exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea and so that they can, China can make use of the resources of the South China Sea through those artificial islands. Now, uh, the Philippines objected to it. The Vietnamese have objected to it. Lots of countries have objected to it. The Philippines took them to the International Court of Justice. And after a lot of uh, give and take there, the International Court of Justice ruled against China. Has China implemented that? No. They don't, they are not a rule based uh, nation. And they are militarily strong. They are a nuclear power, not yet a very strong naval power, but they, they, have, they and economically they are strong. So they think that they can resist the world. It's not as if the United States is going to launch a military operation against uh, China for not uh, agreeing to, uh, not agreeing to, to, to withdraw from the South China Sea. So if tomorrow something happens on Tibet, the United Nations even comes together and passes a resolution on Tibet and says Tibet is actually an independent country. You think the Chinese are going to implement it or listen to the UN? They will never. So this is the important aspect that even with India, 
Don't expect that they will sign an agreement with General Harinder Singh today and implement it tomorrow. They will not do it. As they are demonstrating on ground, the moment after 12 hours of interaction, they get up next morning, they don't agree to anything else. So please learn to live with China in this manner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was really informative. Arushi, go ahead and ask your question. Jain, sir. Sir, you are indeed very energetic. Sir, my question is that uh, you have told us that the Chinese have successfully intruded the Galwan Valley and are in a strategically better position as they can overlook the road towards Dalat Bay Goldi. So what are the steps taken by Indian Army to stop these intrusions as this Galwan Valley lies in our area? Firstly, Galwan Valley does not lie in our area. See the line of... Okay, should, should, I, show you this, should I show you this slide again? No, but it does not lie in ADPA. One sec. The best is to see the slide. Ah, one sec. Why leave it to anything else? We just share this one here. Share screen. Ah, yeah. Share. Now you see, see where the line of actual control is going. This is the one portion of the Galwan Valley which opens out into the estuary and comes into the Shiok River. The major part, this is 50 miles long. The Galwan Valley is 50 miles long behind here. All that is with China. Right? And we are, there's, it's not correct on our part to say that this lies in India. Of course, the line of actual control is there. And for that matter, the whole of Aksai Chin and the whole of Ladakh, all this area actually belongs to India. But we are looking at the ground situation. We, the line of actual control lies here. So the major part of the, of the, of the uh, Galwan Valley lies with the Chinese. Now, We've constructed this road here. We've constructed this road. The Chinese have got limited areas here where they can get observation. And that's exactly what we have objected to. And that's the, one of the major reasons why uh, Colonel Santosh Babu actually went with his 40 men to make sure that there was no construction of a post anywhere on this. Right. Now, uh, uh, if push comes to shove and the Chinese continue insisting that they're going to construct something here, this I think is a major trigger and it will lead to, it will lead to a more serious standoff. It is not going to be acceptable to India to do that, right? Uh, but also remember that uh, we have our capability. We, we've got enough deployment of uh, manpower here. We've got our artillery guns behind. We've got air power available with us. It's not that two men sitting here or 20 men sitting here with some guns located behind can stop all our traffic moving on this road. They tried it in Kargil also, if you remember. But they couldn't, they couldn't stop us at that time. So uh, I don't think, besides the Chinese have come with a clear intent that they are, they are trying to push us around. They're trying to bully us around. Right? And you know the good old principle in any school. The school bully has to be bullied back. Right? Always has to be bullied back. When you bully back a bully, he will cow down himself. So I think the, the, the Indian stance and strategy is absolutely correct. We are, we, are not, we are not provoking anyone. We are not triggering anything. But if, you, if the Chinese insist on doing what they did or did that day or they do it in the future, then they want something coming to them. Uh, Jahan, sir. Jahan. So, a uh, report by CAG tabled in parliament revealed that if India went to a high intensity war, uh, it would have run out most of its ammunition in just 10 days, which should be minimum of 40 days. And if India is in a situation of two front war with China and Pakistan, how will our military respond to such circumstances with limited ammunition? I don't know where these people get these reports from. Uh, is there someone sitting uh, in 
So sorry. One second. Uh, sir, you can hear me? Uh, you can hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, it's CAG, a uh, Comptroller and Audit General of India. So it's a government uh, organization. If I was sitting in the Comptroller and Auditor General office, I would try and make sure that I put out a some strange looking report and never reveal our actual capability. That's what that's what we should always be doing, isn't it? We've got a, our requirement is 30 days intense. Uh, uh, oh, no, sorry, 40 days intense altogether. Altogether, 40 days intense. That's what our uh, ammunition holding should be. Let me tell you, historically, our holding has hardly ever been 40 days intense. Even in 71 war, it was not uh, 40 days intense. Even in Kargil, it was never 40 days intense, right? Uh, uh, but the government has taken a lot of measures. I remember, I remember raising this issue to no less than Mr. Manohar Parikar, the late Mr. Manohar Parikar, when he was alive. I had a dinner with him one day and I raised this issue with him and he said he'll come back to me with an answer. And I was surprised. I don't expect a minister to start uh, going, taking this so seriously and coming back to someone who's asked a question. But Mr. Manohar Parikar was very different. After seven days, I got a call from him. Then, Jal Saab, you had asked me this question and I want to tell you. He had delegated certain powers down to the armed forces, to the Army, Navy and the Air Force to make sure that their ammunition holdings and they, particularly the import of ammunition could be done in a much faster way, uh, doing away with a lot of procedures. And he explained me all that completely. And with that, we have been able to ramp up our overall capability. Uh, and let me also tell you, this 40 days intense is a, one of the most, is one of the biggest misnomers. No army fights intense 24-7, 365 days of the year. You will have one operation somewhere, one more operation somewhere, and then a third operation somewhere. The whole army is not fighting um, the, the intense with, uh, at intense capability or intense rates all the time. So you have enough ammunition capability available with you. 40 days intense is a calculation. It's a calculation, it's a statistical calculation for your logistics management. People take it so literally that every single man must be able to fight for 40 days with his ammunition. It's not true. That's, that's not, that is not the truth and reality. Okay. These are issues which our professionals know how to handle. I don't think the public should really worry about it. Thank you, sir, for your response. Om Pawar, please go ahead and ask your question. Jain sir, uh, I had a question that uh, the people of India, we see a mass movement among them that we are, they are boycotting all the Chinese goods. So like in a situation like this, so like what, should, what could be the government of India stand? Very good, very interesting question, very interesting question. The amount of trade between India and China is to the tune of about 85 billion dollars, which is not a small amount of money, fair amount. Uh, total Indian exports to China are about 18.5 billion dollars and the rest is all import, which means the balance is completely in favor of China, right? So, uh, very frankly saying, uh, if we stop buying Chinese goods, if we do away with Chinese investments and things, it will hurt China. It will hurt China. But China has got a tremendous outreach of business around the world. Uh, and in that, in the Indian, in the Indian component, what I'm led to believe is about 2.5% or so. So while it will hurt China, it will not hurt it so badly also. It may, sometimes it may happen that it may hurt India. Because uh, many of our components which are being used in our manufacturing are actually coming from the supply chain which starts from uh, Eastern China. So I... There are differing opinions on this. Few economists say that it's good for India. Few economists say it's bad for India. But I think a more comprehensive analysis of this is being done by a lot of economic organizations and economic think tanks in India uh, at the moment. Uh, and I do believe that, if nothing else, a national level uh, public awareness of resisting China not only militarily, but socially and economically, this awareness is coming about. And I think there's nothing wrong in promoting that. It's good to keep that stance going and keep projecting to China. You cannot take us for granted. 
Don't think that we can continue having great relations on the economic and social and political front. And at the same time, you come every summer and start uh, war fighting with us on, on, the, on the border. And uh, if it comes to when our men come to explain to you and verify certain decisions which have been taken in our meetings, you start resolving to use of unconventional un, uh, weapons against them. This thing can't go on. Right? We, we, we are a very trusting nation. We are a very ethical nation. And we must continue remaining that. But the world likes nations of that nature, of that type. But we should be make it very clear to China that this attitude will be resisted in the future and resisted by all means. Thank you, yeah. sir. I never thought it that way. Thank you. Over to Divya Shrija. Jai Hind, sir. The, uh, this is the wish here. Yeah. Uh, so my question is that buffer nations like Nepal, although they are not posing as a direct threat to India right now, but manipulation from China cannot be underestimated. So how far are India's current strategies enough to avoid such a situation from happening? Because our Good, relations very, with very, Nepal are very great. Very intelligent question. Very good question. Uh, and you are right. Uh, I did not include this particular aspect in my in my backdrop of India-China relations. That from around about 1988, when uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited uh, China, and thereafter, at the end of the Cold War, the Chinese started uh, this uh, doctrine of what is called the String of Pearls. I'm sure you must have read about it. The String of Pearls. What is the String of Pearls? Essentially, countries like Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Maldives, Seychelles, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan has been, of course, one of our very close allies. Uh, these, these nations must all, the Chinese felt, these nations must all be beholden to China. So that India's strategic neighborhood, it does not look towards India, but looks to China. So this is one of the one of the uh, principal um, uh, aspects of the strategy of uh, the new the maritime silk route, also the new silk route or the Belt and Road Initiative, and the BRI, to link up all these countries, do good for them economically. Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka, uh, they attempted to get a port in uh, in in Maldives. They're trying to do the same in Myanmar and Bangladesh. They're constructing a port there, and. Uh, Similarly with Nepal, somehow um, we've had a hot and cold relationship with most of our, most of our neighborhood. We've done extremely well with our um, extended neighborhood, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, with the, with the Middle East. We've had excellent relations with the Middle East. You've seen um, how even on the 5th of August decisions, most of the countries of the Middle East did not cite with Pakistan. They cited with us. So the, uh, the, the extended areas of far, far better managed by us. Somehow, there has been a slight failing in our ability to manage our immediate neighborhood. Or historically, the current government has made a lot of effort after initial um, bit of hiccups here and there, but we have recovered very well. We've recovered on Sri Lanka. We have recovered Bangladesh. We've got excellent relationship. We've got a very good relationship going with Maldives, <coughs> with Myanmar. <coughs> it's in Nepal. And that is what is surprising. That a buffer state like Nepal, which is such an important state, how come? One of the issues which is there is definitely the fact that this Maoist government is there. And we have not done enough to perhaps reach out to them. And uh, because culturally we have got a great relationship, militarily we have got a great relationship. As I explained to you earlier, 30, 40,000 soldiers are always with us. They've made sacrifices for our country. We are paying pensions to the tune of about 100,000 uh, for pensioners and the of the of the uh, Indian army who are now living in Nepal. We have to leverage all these things. We need to leverage, and I think the government is now fully seized of this. And because a lot is being discussed, uh, seen on the uh, in, in in various think tanks and on uh, channels and things like that. A lot is being talked about India uh, Nepal relationship, and this is going to be one of the critical areas in this uh, emerging uh, tangle with China. We cannot afford to lose Nepal and see Nepal to become closer to China in any way. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. I mean, uh, covering such a great topic, at least uh, it's it's a great feat, and it's so great to listen to you. Thank you. Over to the, my companions. Yeah, uh, sir. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, but it's slightly off the topic. A yeah. topic. How do we see ourselves with coming up on theater commands so as to have a better cohesive force and cooperation between the three armed forces? China and US are already following the same theater command. Very good. Good question. This has been asked by one of our principal from DPS Nagpur. This is okay. uh, and this is a this, this is an ongoing debate. But let me tell you, share with you at the outset that uh, certain directions have already been given by the government of India to the uh, chief of the defense staff immediately on his appointment that within three years, India should be on the threshold of uh, creating the theater commands. There are lots of options of creating theater commands. How do you exactly do it? Um, but let me go back into a little bit of the background. This whole concept has been followed now for many years. Simply because they say that uh, <clears throat> the army has got certain platforms, the navy has got certain platforms, and the air force has got certain platforms. And if they all fight their individual wars, then obviously the benefit of, uh, of, of, the, of the, the collective effort, the benefit of the collective power of these platforms doesn't travel to the nation. The Americans in 1986, and this is something which uh, has been traditionally a major problem with all armed forces of the world. The American armed forces, and the, in the case of the Americans, there's a fourth armed force, which is called the Marine Corps. The, all four of them were against it. <clears throat> and it is... After the failure in Iran, the attempted rescue of the hostages in Iran in 1979, and then the failed Grenada uh, invasion in 1983, that finally President Reagan forced it down the throat of the armed forces. And how did he do it? He got the he got the Congress to look at this through a legislation, uh, an amendment. Uh, it was called the it was called the Goldwater Nichols Act, the Goldwater Nichols Act of 1986 under which the theater commands came up. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the American system is classic. The theater commanders do not report to any uh, army chief or even to the chairman chiefs of staff committee. They report directly to the president of America. They are four-star rank. They promote the report to the defense secretary and then on to the president. So the chiefs of staff committee, the chairman chiefs of staff committee cannot give directions to the Theater commander at the Pacific Command that you will do this operationally. Operationally, only the Defense Secretary and the President can give them orders. Right? You have then you have the headquarters, <clears throat> the Army headquarters, the so-called the, the Joint Headquarters, and you have a Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, who is, uh, well, in their case, also a four-star, but uh, he is the first among equals. And so you also have a chief of the Marines and chief of the Army and chief of the Navy and the Air Force. The chief of the Army there has no powers of the arm over the Army. His, he is a chief of staff, not the chief of the Army, not the chief of the Army. He's the chief of the chief of staff. And he looks at training, he looks at, he looks at logistics, he looks at manpower, human resources, he looks at uh, doctrine and all things like that. Okay, but he takes no operational decision. Now, can this can this this uh, uh, model uh, be transposed and brought to India and immediately put into the Indian model? I say no, it can't. You can't do that. The Chinese have got a different, slightly different model. They've converted their seven, uh, you know, commands into into five theaters. We in India have got a huge problem. We've got a total of seventeen commands. That's the Army, Navy, and Air Force put together. I've got seventeen commands. And we're trying to get them into to come together to have approximately three or four theaters. Uh, interestingly, one theater could be the Northern Theater, for example, um, or the Western Theater. So everything from uh, Jammu and Kashmir West coming down to Punjab is the Western Theater. And uh, it will be primarily the Army and the Air Force um, jointly there. Then you can have a Southern Theater in which you have the whole of Rajasthan, Gujarat, and you have the Maharashtra coast and areas like that, that becomes a theater. So you have the Navy, Army, and the Air Force together in that, right? Now, 
No, so these models are all being looked at and examined in different ways. You already got one theater command, and that is uh, the Andaman and Nicobar command, which is uh, located in Port, at Port Blair. That's the first joint command. Theater command. It is virtually a theater command, right? So <clears throat> let's see how we progress in our study of this whole thing. Uh, the only problem is that the current threat, the Chinese threat, um, collusive Pakistani threat, is uh, acting upon us, is right on us, and in the midst of these threats, to try and do something premature like, like trying to create theater commands, etc., to my mind is not a very, very good decision. Because you need to give this system time to, to mature. You know, we're having uh, the integrated battle group concept and things like that. All kinds of things are being tried out. But then we are in the midst of now a situation which was really not anticipated, in which the Chinese have suddenly gone very bolshy. They are getting very pushy and bullish in their whole attitude. The Pakistanis are probably going to join them in trying to do these things. So, uh, in the midst of this, should we be experimenting? Or should we stick around to the current systems and probably hope that through better connectivity, through, through better systems and things like that, that jointness or level of jointness will be achieved. Yeah, you can have a next question if you like, or you, whatever you like. Yeah, so thank you, General. It has been a very insightful journey in the evening, and I'm sure all our viewers have been a lot more informed about the China conundrum. Thank you for sharing the chronological and the geographical aspect of the issue, which I'm sure many of us were not so well versed with it. So thank you for your gracious presence and have a good day. Thank you very much, ma'am. And what a great pleasure it's been to be with you all. And I wish you all a great future, the schools and all your, all your students. I'm sure they will grow on, go on to make us all very proud, make India proud. Thank you thank so much, you Anjay. Thank you so much, sir. And a big thank you to all our viewers from Varanasi, Nasik and Nagpur. <coughs> thank you for viewing. And thank you for tuning in. Jai Hind. Good night.